Welcome to the European Institute for Asian Studies. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning at this uh, AS briefing seminar on uh, Chatrofa. And I'm not at all a Chatrofa expert, so I will leave that to the other colleagues uh, on this podium who uh, I think are, are more experienced than myself. But I do want to say a few words uh, by means of um, introduction, by means of opening, about this, this EPTC um, adventure because I would call it an adventure at this stage. And European Business and Technology Center is, in fact, an, uh, an initiative that was taken uh, by the European Union, by the European Commission, more than five years ago already, um, which, in essence, is about uh, promoting uh, market access for European SMEs into the Indian market, on the one hand, and on the other hand, trying to contribute um, to the challenges which India is facing uh, around clean technology, uh, environmental challenges, etc. So it's trying to combine these two objectives and, and the, in a context, I would say, of, let's say, a bigger debate, a bigger um, challenge, probably, around the um, competitiveness of European business in today's uh, globalized economy. Uh, I think all of you will know that um, European business, especially in particular European um, SMEs, um, are facing uh, increased competition. <coughs> if you just look at the share of the um, European business um, on the Indian market share, about 10 years ago it was uh, more or less 33% of the, um, let's say, foreign share of the Indian market was about 33% European. Today we are down to 20%. So basically, European business has lost um, its, its, its piece of the cake, so to speak, on the Indian market. And EBTC <coughs> sorry, was created to do something about it, to try to give a push to stimulate um, access to the uh, Indian market, but as been said before, with that very clear focus on clean technology. And because on the one hand, there is a strong need, there is a demand in India, um, but there is here in Europe a strong offer. There are many SMEs, there's many research institutes that have state-of-the-art technology uh, across different sectors that can help um, solve some of the challenges which India is facing. And it's EBTC is all about bringing together those, um, those two sides. Um, <coughs> EBTC is a, is a complex adventure, um, uh, existing now for about four years, involving um, different partners, both um, in, in, in India and here in Europe. We basically try to bring together the, let's say, the traditional business organizations, whether they are chambers of commerce, which we as Euro Chambers represent here uh, across Europe, uh, research institutes, uh, clean tech associations. So bringing these different players together and make them work together with Indian counterparts. And again, in India, we have a long list at this stage of, uh, of partners, uh, whether it's the industry federations, the chambers, again, more sector-specific organizations. So basically, different stakeholders that we try to bring together, working, as uh, Axel already mentioned, in platforms. Uh, the, the whole platform ID is something that we, we, we nurture very much within, uh, within EBTC. Um, and gradually, you know, as I said, develop this, um, these success stories being trying to be very concrete at the level of individual sectors, individual companies, making concrete, um, uh, offering concrete uh, solutions. And for your information, EBTC is not a standalone um, initiative. Um, since EBTC was created five years ago, to some extent, similar initiatives have been developed in uh, China and in Thailand. So there is today an, an EU SME center in Beijing, and there is also an EU ASEAN business center in uh, Bangkok, which broadly have the same objective, which is all about, again, um, facilitating initiatives to facilitate market access for European SMEs into those uh, markets. 
In the case of China, it is not that clean tech focus, but there is some other sector focus. But it's, the basic idea is the same. It's taking a European dimension, a European initiative to facilitate access for SMEs you know, into these <coughs> uh, challenging, challenging markets. Um, and as we hear the discussions at the level of the European Union, European Commission, such type of initiatives, uh, promoting market access, uh, facilitating the whole SME internationalization uh, process, more of such initiatives will probably be taken. Uh, there is discussion today about doing similar, doing something similar like EBTC, for example, in some South American countries, um, other Asian countries. So this EBTC is very much a, a pilot activity, it's very much a test run uh, for developing similar initiatives in other parts um, of the world. So that's very much, uh, let's say, the background to, um, uh, to, to EBTC. Today, of course, we focus very much on this uh, Jatrufa um, uh, seminar, uh, and that's why I said I will, I will leave it to the, uh, to the experts to, to take you through some uh, presentations, um, explaining more concretely what EBTC, um, in partnership with EAS, um, has been uh, has been doing. Axel already mentioned, and will be doing in the uh, in the near future. Uh, I would simply like to add that <coughs> we're very happy to work with EAS uh, in EBTC, and I think also in some other activities in Asia, we've been able to to cooperate quite well. And I hope also in the future we'll be uh, able to continue this this good cooperation. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. I don't know if I if I need a microphone really to, to speak, is it? Uh, yeah. But uh, but well. Uh, so first of all, I would like to, to thank very much uh, for the invitation to to this to the seminar. Um, and uh, and well, I, I don't have a presentation as such, but uh, I just wanted to to, to say that uh, we are very much. Uh, and by saying we, I also need to 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 raise your atten attention that I'm not alone here from the unit, but also. Uh, 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 Ms. Christina uh, Naneva from the unit is also here, and uh, she can also uh, maybe ask, uh, maybe can be asked uh, for some questions. Or and uh, and uh, and um, uh, we are very much uh, happy to be involved in in in, in the activity since uh, actually uh, um, the uh, activities of uh, European Commission mm -hmm. uh, uh, Director General for Research and Innovation is um, uh, shifting somewhat from research, which used to be the case in the past, towards more innovation aspects. And this very much involves uh, uh, emphasis given to SME involvement and, uh, and, uh, and increased uh, uh, activities uh, in terms of applications and developing new products and, and processes and, and so on. And also uh, very much is, in, is uh, connected to international cooperation. So. Uh, we uh, have a number of projects that, that deal with uh, cooperation with different regions of the world, including India as well. And uh, in the case of, of Yatrofa, the topic of this discussion today, actually uh, we have one specific project that deals with uh, cooperation on Yatrofa with uh, not only India, India is also involved, but also with other regions of the world, uh, with uh, Africa and uh, Central America, from, from where, as I understand, Yatrofa actually comes. So, uh, so this uh, this is one example, and and Christina can explain about this project if if necessary later on, perhaps. Um, and um, what I can say also is that uh, 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 the fact that we have these projects and and more projects involving other uses of uh, of uh, um, plants for for development of biofuels in this case, um, such as for instance uh, use of uh, sweet sorghum. We have also another project. Uh, in which India is involved, so 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 there is a portfolio of, of of these activities, but of course they do not come simply by on their own. They they come from from uh, the policy that uh, um, uh, looks on on development of, of of these new technologies, but also uh, as in in a in a, in a broader uh, scope uh, as as a uh, mechanism to build uh, what we call by economy. So so. Uh, as you may know, last year, in uh, January last year, uh, the European Commission published a European um, a strategy for development of bioeconomy in Europe. So, uh, so this uh, uh, 
uh, this is a, a more a policy uh, uh, angle in which uh, 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 the research projects and, and research uh, activities support development of, of, of bioeconomy. And what it means is, is connecting different sectors of, uh, of, of economy, such as uh, agriculture, fisheries, uh, 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 forestry, and, uh, and biotechnologies uh, towards uh, 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 new well, innovation aspects and new uh, uh, development of new products and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, at, at the center of, uh, of, of, uh, of a bioeconomy concept, uh, well, actually, uh, of course, it can be defined in, in different ways. But plant biotechnology certainly is, is very important in this in this in this in this field, uh, since uh, what we have is uh, is the concept of biorefinery. So so uh, of, of using different products from the agriculture, from from uh, from waste, also from from forestry and and and, and uh, also fisheries um, for uh, new uh, uh, ways of of of, of of using all these resources, biological resources, and uh, and providing food and uh, and non-food products and uh, and also biofuels, of course. Um, so uh, so this is more a, a broad kind uh, uh, of policy uh, perspective in in this uh, in this field. Um, what um, can be said also is that uh, uh, Horizon 2020 is the new. Uh, uh, framework program that will be starting next year. Uh, the projects that I mentioned the, on cooperation with India and uh, uh, and in other regions, uh, they come from a frame, frame, a seven framework programs of so the current framework program. Uh, the new framework program will continue in terms of uh, international cooperation, so it will be open as, as we have uh, uh, the, the situation now in FP7 for all the regions of the world there will be some differences when it comes to financing so some regions some countries will not receive automatic financing as is the case now and actually india is, is one case of uh, to, that needs to be mentioned here so in fp7 uh, uh, the BRIC countries so india is one of them russia china uh, used to receive automatic funding this will not longer be the case in uh, horizon 2020 so this may create some uh, some uh, difference uh, in terms of uh, how the consortia are built. So and this this will need to be taken on board, I think, when when it comes to cooperation uh, uh, in, uh, in in research uh, with uh, with India. But of course, it should not uh, mean that there will be less participation. Uh, it means that uh, new sources of funding will need to be found on on the on the Indian side, of course. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, our experience when it comes to uh, to this uh, so uh, so this new strategy of international cooperation is uh, is being tested in many ways, and uh, and so far the experience was positive. Although it was not the case, it was not so far tested with India. It was more tested with China and uh, and also uh, Latin America. In in which case we saw that actually there was a big interest to to, to cooperate with Europe and and to find uh, resources for that. Um, and um, also, when it comes to new approaches in, in Horizon 2020, uh, there will be uh, certainly uh, uh, attempts, attempts and, 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 and a big effort made to simplify the, the participation. So this, this should allow a creation of, of consortia and, uh, and open more creativity for, for consortia when it comes to scientific content. So, uh, so the, the approach is to, to be more uh, bottom up and, and to give more space for uh, for uh, uh, presentation of proposals, uh, not in a very prescribed way as we saw in many cases in the past in FP7, but more on a, on a, on a, on a more uh, uh, open way. And also um, an interesting uh, new element when it comes to, um, to our part of a, of a program uh, will be uh, uh, the um, starting of, of, uh, of partnerships in cooperation between private and, uh, and public sites, so public sites uh, represented by the European Commission with funding from, 
from uh, Horizon 2020. And uh, from the private side, uh, creation of, uh, of, of uh, partnership uh, uh, in bio-based products. Uh, and uh, and um, actually, uh, this partnership is about to be announced uh, in, actually, I think tomorrow, actually, there will be an announcement uh, uh, by the commission president uh, himself. Uh, the partnership uh, will uh, uh, involve uh, a, a large industry, but also many SMEs. And, uh, and it is open to participation uh, of all of SMEs and uh, uh, of, a, of a public side uh, represented by the commission, but also, of course, with involvement of uh, academic sector and, uh, and very much uh, following the, the same rules of openness and uh, involvement of, uh, of, all the of all the participants from, from academic and, and, uh, and, and commercial side. So I think I will stop with this because, uh, um, and uh, I'm very, ha very happy to, to answer any, any questions. Thank you very much, Axel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, not only to very briefly explain again what EBTC is about, but also to dig deeper into the topic of Jetrova, which is a fascinating plant, as I had the pleasure of discovering over the past couple of months. EBTC is the European Business and Technology Center in India, managed by Euro Chambers. It has two big pillars of activity. On the one hand, it provides tailored services ranging from market exploration to the establishment of companies in the Indian market. And at the other hand, the second pillar is that we feed into EU-India policy dialogue through our ne network and connections with the Indian government, the EU delegation, and other important players in the Indian political scene. In very short, what is EBTC about? We have, as was mentioned before, four key sectors that we are mandated for. This is biotech, energy, environment, and transport. EBTC is consisting of four offices covering all of India. New Delhi in the north, Mumbai in the west, Bangalore in the south and Kolkata in the east. There's 20 staff working in total, full time on the four key sectors, plus also with an IPR expert that is heading an IPR help desk to facilitate companies with any IPR related challenges that they might face when entering the Indian market. And we do all of this through our 30 partners within Europe, of which EAS is a key partner. And over the years, since we were established in 2008, already 22 cooperation agreements have been facilitated between a European company on the one hand and an Indian company on the other hand. More than 300 delegates have been brought from Europe to India for several activities from 24 different EU states in total. And what EBDC is also doing is concretely scouting in the Indian market for concrete project opportunities that need an EU technology solution. These project briefs are then uploaded on the EBDC website, and we try and match these with European organizations and companies that could then provide a technology solution. Why Jetrova? Um, I assume that many people in the room are already familiar with the plan, but maybe not everybody. And as I had the pleasure of discovering myself more about Jetrova, I uh, regret that I haven't taken any picture with me to show how the plant looks like, but it's about six meters high, it's green, and it grows on very dry lands, sometimes even wasteland, but it does not need a lot of water. According to different sources, I'm sure that Frank can explain on that more in detail, but only 250 to 600 millimeters of rainwater per year. And just with this limited amount of water that is needed, the Jatropha seeds can, per hectare, produce 400 to 600 liters of oil. Because when you press the seed of a Jatropha plant, it 
what comes out in the end is 27 to 40 percent of oil. Oil that can be used as fuel for cars, as a biofuel for cars, but even for jet fuel. And this is why it becomes very interesting, especially for India, since India's energy security is very much linked to renewable resources. India is the fifth largest primary energy consumer and the fourth largest petroleum consumer in the world. Even more so, for all the needs that India is facing with its rapidly growing cities and its increasing needs for transportation, it cannot continue to import oil. And for the moment, India has only 23% of crude oil that it is providing itself, that it is coming from domestic origins. Therefore, its dependency on crude oil to import it is over 75%. Hence, the interest of the Indian government, but also Indian companies and Indian cities, to switch towards the use of more renewable energies, including biofuels. Biofuels um, is an eco-friendly alternative fuel generated from renewable resources, such as vegetable oils, can be edible or non-edible oils, and animal fats. It can be blended in many ratios with fossil fuels, such as diesel, current engine technologies, with no major modifications required. And what is very interesting also about biofuels is that um, it can be managed with the existing infrastructure for petroleum, in terms of refining, storage, transport, the facilities, with a minor alteration, yes, but in comparison with electric vehicles, which would need an entire restructuring of the economy and of providing more storage facilities and recharging facilities, it is not the case with, with biofuels to the same extent. Of course, also with biofuels, there are less greenhouse gas emissions being emitted. And therefore, also, um, we look at biofuels uh, as a key focus area because it is a focus area of the Indian government that has already been led out in a national uh, policy and also a national mission. That is the way in which the Indian government is, is defining its policy priorities. This national policy on biofuels is, among others, laying out that uh, it wants to do the biodiesel production taking it from non-edible oil seeds, from waste and degraded marginal lands. That means that there is no competition with crops growing on, on, on different types of land that would produce edible seeds. The indicative target that the government has, of India has set out is that it wants to be able by 2017 to mix biofuels to 20% with other types of fuel. That is, in fact, more ambitious, more ambitious than the EU's target, where, according to the EU's strategy on renewable energy, every EU member state should only by 2020 reach a minimum of 10% blending of biofuels with traditional types of fuel. This slide presents the Indian stakeholders that are dealing with biofuels and Jatropha in particular. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them, but important to note is that the Ministry of Rural Development is a nodal ministry that is responsible for the implementation of the policies led out by the government. Now, what is the... Uh, exact potential for Jetrofa. After having sketched the context, um, it is interesting to note that at present, ethanol is still the most widely produced biofuel in India. That is produced mostly from sugarcane waste. And then the next one in line are the tree bearing oil seeds, of which you have two categories, the edible ones and the non-edible ones. In the edible 
category you have soybeans, sunflowers, mustard seeds. And then in the non-edible category, you find the Jatropha curcas, and another variant is the Ongamia pinaba. Like mentioned before, the edible seeds, they can't be used for biofuel production in India due to the government's wish to always prioritize food over fuel. And then among the non-edible tree-bearing oil seeds, Jatropha has been identified as the most suitable seed for the Indian market. As it was mentioned also in the introduction, now one million hectare in plantation are already being developed, but there is a potential to extend the areas at which Jatropha can flourish to 30 million of hectares in India. There are two challenges that India has to face, after which I will then expand upon the solutions that EAS and EBTC are together looking at. Oil seeds dominated by Jatropha and also the other variant, Pongamia, they are still not adequately supported by price and market mechanisms, even though they hold immense promise to be harnessed in the biofuel market. A second challenge is that Jatropha plantations are plagued with different difficulties. There's a lot of variety in the yields, depending on what land has been selected, what crops are being used, how these crops are treated, and what kind of research and innovative business models they need to apply it to get the most out of every hectare of Jatropha. And this is exactly why the EBTC work plan for 2013 has already started to address some of these challenges by creating together with EAS this Indian EU collaboration platform that enables biofuel projects in India. What is written in this work plan of the European Business and Technology Center? The objective is to extend the platform for sustainable solutions for Jatropha based biofuels to India so that it can suit the Indian conditions and meet also the demand. The outcome should be that the global platform between Europe and India can bring necessary expertise and assets together to address the issues and challenges for developing a viable value chain and also business models to exploit the um, benefits that Jetrofa can bring. I will skip this slide in the interest of time management. Why is EBTC engaged with Jetrofa? Because it touches, in fact, upon all of the four key sectors that EBTC is mandated for. In the field of biotechnology, there is a concrete link between biofuels and algal research being done. In the field of energy, there is, of course, a lot of interest to generate power from the paste that is left after having pressed the seeds of Jatropha. And of course, also the oil itself could be used for greening vehicles, which is why it touches upon our transport sector. And in the end, also the environment sector is um, touched upon because in the end, when India would manage to use more Jatropha, it would reduce the pollutants in the air. To build upon the two workshops that have been held already, um, these were, as mentioned, uh, organized in December and in June. The first workshop had as its concrete outcomes that initial focus on the Jatropha variant was completely uh, endorsed. There is also a need for sharing best practices from the EU and to continue the stakeholder dialogue. And also specific challenges have been identified, such as knowing that not all the wasteland can be used, but it is also important to uh, grow the crops in a sustainable way and give them not the most marginal of lands to grow on, but also treat uh, these better and also respect the water requirements. 
and give the water in time when the plant is throwing its seeds. The second workshop in June um, had as its outcomes that uh, concrete pilot initiatives will be designed. Among others, training programs will be set up in partnership even with the Indian Oil Corporation, which means that it's not only the small SMEs looking at Jatrofa, but even big Indian stakeholders. And that a life cycle analysis of the entire system needs to be conducted so that the limited substitution of the fossil fuel can be done in a strategic way. And therefore also, research and business opportunities have to be investigated in the supply chain. I'm coming towards the end of my presentation, but I cannot end yet before picturing a view on the longer term. What do we want to reach with these activities? It is that we want to exchange knowledge. Yes, we want to do the commercial partnering, and we want to keep the dialogue open to overcome the challenges that are currently presenting themselves. These are the barriers, the technical barriers, the commercial barriers that we have mentioned to make it more economically viable, the exploitation of Jatrofa. We want to take into account biodiversity rights. There are still fragmented policies that need to be coordinated. There are different solutions that need to be discussed and then definite solutions need to be determined in terms of how varieties can be detoxicated, use better industrial processes, and also draw upon international collaboration. And concrete capacity building needs to be done with training for specific companies, stakeholders, and doing field visits. This is my last slide. We have, in this presentation, touched upon the political backing that biofuels have and enjoy in India because of the needs for India to switch towards more renewable energy. There is concrete policies in place with, among others, the national mission on biofuels. The potential is huge, but a lot of challenges still need to be overcome. And this is why there are concrete opportunities for EU entities to participate in the platform and bring their expertise towards India, not only in terms of creating better policies, also establishing better research partnerships to, among others, look at new and robust oilseed varieties through genetic engineering, do the capacity building with trainers and site visits, make Indian joint ventures, trade oil seeds, look at import, export interests, make more innovative business models so that the Indians would do the homework as well and look at a longer term perspective and make sure that uh, there are returns on the investment in planting Jetrofa. This was it for what concerns EBTC. Please do not hesitate to contact directly our energy expert who is sitting in the New Delhi office of EBTC and of course Elias and Frank from uh, Sir Axel and uh, Frank from from Elias as the key partner who are piloting this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful technical introduction here on the status quo of where Yatrofa is, where we are, and what we can do from Europe to help the Indian stakeholders to work together. Because indeed what we've seen is that with the Yatrofa, as you've rightfully pointed out, there have been already plantations, there have been already experience, but not necessarily with the right plants, with the right technologies, and with the right business model. And this is one of the reasons why I put on the whiteboard there um, a little drawing that is not in the presentation. The presentation itself you have as a handout, so I will not read out all the slides. You can see the background on, and I will just zip through some of the slides to guide you which information is there. But I think for the questions and answer round discussion, it's very important to see where are the challenges, how can we bring the different partners together, and, and what is really lacking in our business models here. 
And I'll come back to the whiteboard in, in a minute after zipping through some of the slides here. I think that is the key of the, of the discussion what we need here. Who can do what? So far, this has been driven by science or by businesses with existing products. And obviously, we've seen a lot of challenges there in practice. So what we are doing here is, uh, is how can we work internationally together, not only on the technical and the business level, but also on the policy level. Where, where are the challenges? This is the picture that of the plant that you were looking for. Uh, it can indeed grow up to six meters if, if it's a mature tree, but most of the plantations, they keep the, the trees a little bit smaller, to, they, they, uh, they trim so that every year there will be new fruits. The fruits, as you can see, are rounded, and depending on the type of variety of plant, you have small fruits up to big, uh, big fruits. Uh, they have a high oil content, and um, what we have done in December, as, as was pointed out by Philippe, a first round table where we brought not only scientists, but also business people and policy makers, uh, stakeholders, and landowners, and big industry. All these four that are normally are parties that are not meeting with each other, we brought them into one room with over 60 people discussing together from who knows what, where are the challenges, and can we understand commonalities here. So the, you will find in the handout the, the overview of the, of the agenda where we discussed, and as you can see in the agenda, we discussed challenges and possible solutions. What is a way forward? A panel discussion resulted in a number of recommendations. Um, you can find the discussion in detail in your handout. I just wanted to highlight uh, a few things in these slides. Um, first of all, here, this one, as was pointed out before, avoid competition with food. That means just cultivating the Yatrofa on wastelands and marginal lands is the best option. Disadvantage is that the yields and harvests are much lower. So you still need some fertilizer, you still need some water, and perhaps different selection of plants to, to raise enough yield. And this is the first challenge that was um, seen in practice in India. People have just taken a plant that was available, growing there, put them on a large-scale plantation on wastelands, and expected, as Axel said earlier, that this miracle plant would automatically grow. Well, there's no free lunch, was, as the Americans say. So indeed, uh, the harvest have not been as, as good as uh, was promised. Now, the reason for that is, is very simple. As Axel already said, they have been proceeding with these plants without doing proper homework. If they would have selected better varieties who can actually grow in these marginal lands and given water only at certain times of setting fruits and setting flower, then the harvest would have been much bigger. But this is technology, this is knowledge, uh, know how, how to cultivate these plants under difficult conditions. That knowledge we do have in Europe, but that was not necessarily taken into account in India by the, uh, the plantation owners. So there's the first te technical challenge. The second challenge was really um, the fragmentation of the different players. So uh, industry landowners had not the technical knowledge, and then industries who were using the oil were not necessarily in direct contact with the plantation growers, the plant growers. So that the, the oil yield was not only not enough, but maybe not of this, the right uh, specifications that the industry were uh, needing. Um, there is also a lack of critical mass. Even though a million hectares have been planted, uh, critical mass in terms of number of players connected to each other. Uh, it's still a young industry. For, don't forget that oil palms, to, to increase oil palm yield, select the right varieties, and know exactly how you deal with these plants took a hundred years to actually optimize the whole model, the whole business model. And the Atrofa has been planted just a few years ago, less than 10 years. So we are still learning how to manage the expectations versus the actual yields. And then a technical thing, again, has been that many wrong locations have been uh, chosen, either because uh, the soil was good, but the fertilizer, fertilized, uh, the weather and the, and the water conditions were not right, or the temperatures were too high, 
or a lack of phosphorus in the fertilizer. So there are a number of factors that have not been taken into account properly. Then um, there's a huge discussion on intellectual property. As we said earlier, as you pointed out, Philippe, intellectual property are very important for the small medium enterprises if they want to develop new breeds that they get some kind of exclusivity or a fair return on their knowledge investments. There's a second part, not only the breeding rights, but also the intellectual property based on and linked to biodiversity. As was mentioned before, the Yatrofa is a native plant to Central America, Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Costa Rica. In, in this area, there are more than 300 different varieties. None of those have been commercialized yet. They're native to these lands. Some of them have much better characteristics than that are used in India at the moment. So there's a fantastic potential there that is untapped. However, Mexico now is the first country who has actually signed the Nagoya Protocol on biodiversity and, and protection of its own biodiversity rights. So how do you do in practice a transfer of seeds and biodiversity rights to breed in India and giving a fair return back to the owners in Mexico? This is a huge debate for policymakers and for technical specialists on IP law. That is completely new also for the Indians. And I think in Europe we have a little bit of expertise with this and we could definitely engage in a policy debate that could solve this challenge in the long term. The moment that you start st making money, this will be extremely important. So we need to start with these policy discussions already now, so that these can be implemented in the years to come. And then uh, there are technical, technical reasons that knowledge to be built up. Um, the use of the products is not only oil. Contrary to what everybody says, biodiesel you can make from the oil by esterification, that's all nice and it can indeed even be used in the aviation industry. Uh, it can be used for large biodiesel engines in the railroad industry, but each of these need different specifications. The level of purity for the aviation industry is much higher than if you use it in a, in a rural truck tractor on, on a local road. So taking that into account, you may end up with different types of bio, biofuel, depending on where you use it. Uh, Indian railroads actually dis, uh, described, um, no, the Indian oil described in June a new action where the Yatrofa oil is not converted into biodiesel but directly used as lubricant. Quite an interesting new possibility of creating value without turning it into diesel. And then the leftover cake. Uh, can be used for fertilizer soap as feedstock if you're working with non-toxic Yatrofa plants. They do exist, not in India, but in Mexico. There are a number of plants that actually create edible fruits. And that way you can create more value out of the leftover waste for the local farmers. That changes the economic model and the calculation on how much value comes out of a plant. This has not been calculated in detail. So we need to work on the economics as well. And then, of course, there are some other uses here. Um, then, uh, logically, you think, as a businessman, I think of what is the real business case. If you grow plants, you invest, you want to earn money. And the local farmer, as well as the plantation owner, wants to make a profit on this in the long term. It takes a few years before these trees grow and, and bear fruits. But then they can grow up to 50 years. So it's a long-term investment we're talking about. We need to do this carefully. Um, taking the environmental impact into account is a very important one, as uh, there was a presentation in June also on uh, retaining soil and avoiding erosion on slopes. The tr plants actually uh, uh, retain fertile soil on these erosions, and that can improve the land use over a very long time. So there is more value for the environment on top of the economic value here. Uh, that is indirect economical value. Mm -hmm. So combinations are very important for the business case too. The whole value chain needs to be taken into account. And I will come back to that in the, in the whiteboard later. And then, as I said, there are uh, land use and ownership issues. Who owns the land? Is it land that is owned by the railroads, like marginal lands along the railroad tracks? that are currently not used, 
that will be fantastically val easy for transport of the oil to different places. Or are we focusing on, um, on local models with local farmers? On marginal lands, the farmers are very poor. So there is a poor uh, poverty and local rural development aspect to it that may not be high-end economics, but rural development. And that is a very different business case. And, and, and this is where the politicians can, uh, can push, can enable, can facilitate. And uh, we have in Europe a number of um, institutes who have very good knowledge and know-how on this kind of rural development. We are not only talking about large-scale industry here. And then uh, we're talking about big industries like Indian oil and the railroads on their CSR policies, the corporate social responsibility. If they invest some of their CSR work in the rural development, they can enable change in a country like India enormously. So just to sketch that there are far more aspects to it than just generating oil. Uh, and then f finally, of course, trade policies. And this is where EAS comes in again to, to debate from what is the standpoint of Europe versus India and Asia with trade, international trade policies. I'll skip this, but uh, share, clearly sharing of expertise and good practices from all over the world. There are practices in Brazil, Mexico, Tanzania, Mali also, pilot studies there who have turned quite positive in their local context. And can we learn from that and maybe transplant and copy that into Indian context? You cannot just copy, but you can learn. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the critical mass. Uh, one of the presentations of the Indian railroads was, yes, we are very interested in this oil. If you can deliver the oil on so many million tons per year, <laughs> according to these specifications, and the current plantations do not have that critical mass to produce it. They're too small yet. And that's why visibility and platforms are very important to spread the message. Where are the problems? Who can do what? How can we collaborate? And the, the last slides, I, I just want to skip this, but translating knowledge and services into products and solutions, it's a long way. It's a long road. And nobody can do this completely alone. So we need a lot of um, leveraging private funding and external partners and creating sufficient capacity plus a supportive legal context. And the politicians here have their own facilitating role. They should not run after the facts. They should be anticipating this. Therefore, we do need some leadership. And leadership is necessary to give direction. But far more important is also to think of, are we not inventing or de developing something, innovative solutions that are not linked to the market? If the market is not ready for the solutions, we are too early or disconnected. And that's why I wanted to go to the business case. Creating the market and facilitating access for prototypes and innovation, you need extra money to open up the market. And that is critical for businesses to grow. And quite often this is forgotten. I'm an investor as well. And, and, and looking at the different investment opportunities, investors only come in when a product prototype is there and there is a connection with the market. And quite often we forget that last part how to connect innovation to the market. And, and again, as I said, government has a role there at the regulatory, legal, and fiscal level to facilitate and open up that market access and set up next to allowing investors to facilitate. Uh, so we knew that's the end conclusion here a bit. We need innovation also at the policy level, at the system level, not only at the product level. And quite often, we just focus on this, especially scientists, they focus on this part. But we also need f innovation on business models and, and the processes, how we collaborate. And I think that is the reason why we uh, propose this platform, to bring these different stakeholders, including the policymakers, in the same environment, to start understanding from each other where the challenges are. And uh, with that, uh, this is a sketch which is open for this debate and discussion and input from you on how such a platform can channel discussions. And that is our, our contact details, but I'll leave the previous one on the slide. It's fairly simple in the way that um, I drew this 
to draw the attention to what many people don't don't realize um, there is a difference between the business case in a value chain and innovation innovation happens here when you translate uh, IDs TLR stands for technology readiness level and and that is TRL apologies TRL is is going from new IDs like a plant or a new process or a new genomic modification in a plant uh, that is really from the technology level up to a prototype level and that's what I said earlier you scientists and engineers are very good in developing new products and new prototypes and all that but the connection to the market is through the value chain so do not mix innovation chain and development of, of products and processes with creating value. Creating value is this one. And that is using know-how and components like plants and prototypes and, and new, new varieties and know-how on how to cultivate them. Translate that into prototype situations at the level of plantations or in actual use. So the products and services are then linked through a, an individual business case through distributors and brought to the market. And this end, that last part, is where the value is created. Only when you make the connection to the market. And, and this is something that scientists have difficulty grasping. Business people are, are really on this level. Scientists are very much on this level. So we need to connect. And as I said, as I said in my, one of my slides, the governments are there for facilitating the access and providing access to not only to the market but also to co-investors. So with that, I'd like to thank you and, and uh, maybe we can open the debate for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, if you really like this video, then make sure you subscribe here and make sure you never miss out on one.